welcome everyone to our uh, reincarnated CHRS uh, TV interest group. Uh, it's been a couple years. We've uh, you know, had to deal with COVID for the last few years that canceled our events. And it's a, it's, a, it's a nice testament to all of you that we're back this year. You're an interesting and creative bunch of people and, and we enjoy getting together in this way to swap uh, tales of antique TV. It's, a, you know, it's really a wonderfully interesting technical era that we're celebrating. Uh, often here in Silicon Valley, we like to think that what has happened over the last 30 years with integrated circuits and computers and internet is so impressive, and it is. But when I think back of what happened in the 1920s through the 1960s in radio and television technology, it's equally exciting. Uh, you know, looking at, for example, the advent of color television. They had scarcely gotten black and white TV working and adopted, and yet David Sarnoff, by sheer force of will and way too much money, uh, forced this thing through. And, you know, the shadow mask CRT technology is a really difficult and crazy thing to do, and yet they, they commercialize it. That's it. Uh, every bit as impressive as the things that have gone on more recently. Uh, as I was preparing this little demo on the Philco Safari last night, too, it occurred to me that uh, you know that television set, transistorized portable, is only 11 years after that first point contact crude uh, uh, transistor, the first transistor, that picture from Bell Labs with Bardeen and Cooper and Shockley. How do you get that in 11 years from that to that television? It's exciting. They, they were as productive and creative and impressive as anything that's occurred in Silicon Valley in recent years. So it's exciting to, to, to celebrate uh, that era, uh, and that's what we're here to do. Uh, let me give just a quick uh, overview of the talks so you know what's coming up. I think we have a really nice collection of talks this time. Uh, so uh, uh, the first thing will be uh, uh, Mike Adams talking about the CHRS uh, television book. Uh, that was a team effort. A number of people here put together, uh, and these guys edited it. A uh, very nice book on antique televisions. And uh, then we've got lots of interesting, and uh, I think we'll all learn a lot from all these camera uh, presentations that John Staples is going to make. You see the first one there on image-intensified camera tubes. And uh, then at 10.50, uh, looking forward to Chris Musselman talking about amateur television, something I've always been curious about but know almost nothing about. I'm looking forward to seeing that. And then uh, Richard Deal at 11.20 with a narrowband uh, TV demo, and you can see some of the apparatus here already working. Uh, we'll learn about that and, and, and see what he's got to say there. And uh, then another uh, uh, camera presentation from John Staples uh, on a bomber camera. I presume that's from an airplane bomber, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. So that thing. So we'll, we'll learn something about that. And then uh, this afternoon, uh, we do get lunch, of course. Uh, so that'll be great. And we are appreciative of that. Uh, John will kick us off in the afternoon with uh, the, the RCA TK76 camera, a real workhorse for the industry. And uh, then Chris will come back as well after lunch uh, and talk about sources and how we interface antique TVs. Uh, can't put uh, digital TV signals directly into these TVs anymore, so we'll see uh, some of the interesting options for that. And then Gilles will talk about uh, the, the head end that we've got here at CHRS Radio Central and also the technology uh, that was developed uh, over the years. And Gilles was a very active part of that industry, so we'll hear about that. And then a short break, and then after that, uh, Ron Code uh, coming down from Reno. And we'll hear a little bit about the, the early days and, and who gets credit rightly and wrongly for various things in the television. And uh, then uh, Nat Pendleton, uh, who's coming a little later this morning, he'll have set up over here a pre-war TT5 set that'll be operating. Uh, and his talk will not be so much on the technology, but uh, interesting, the, the historical context in the stations and so forth that were going on there. And, uh, and then Steve Garaventa, uh, observations from TV studios, looking forward to that. And John will finish up with uh, one last presentation on several camera topics at that time. 
Uh, one thing I'm quite thankful is we have a few non-technical presentations mixed in. I enjoy the technical presentations very much, but not all of us are, are technical heavy lifters, and it's good to have some of these presentations that touch on other facets of the hobby and the historical context as well. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, of course, I really want to thank uh, CHRS for hosting this year. We didn't have a, a place to host it in somebody's home here in the Bay Area this time around, so it's very nice to do this. This space was not set up for this kind of thing, so several people, uh, John in particular and Steve Cushman and Jill also played a role. And I'm sure there were a few others as well. Uh, Mike helped, Mike Adams helped with uh, public publicity and so forth. Really appreciate what was done here to put this space together to be ready for this. So thank you, and uh, with that, I will step aside and turn this over to Mike to tell us about the television book. Okay. Today we're gonna to talk about television, and some of us here call it radio with pictures. And what I wanna do is talk mostly about this book, which I hope you have. How many of you have this book? Oh my, we have, okay, how many would, would like to have one to take home today? Okay, good, I think we, I think we can take care of you. Uh, a, few, a, few years, a few years ago, we published this book on uh, television history, and uh, it was written mostly by us uh, and you. Some of, them, of you in this room did all the work here. And um, it's on television technical history, restoration, and collection. Uh, we, we brought some guest scholars in to, to do some original stuff. We brought in uh, John Logie Baird's son. We found Malcolm at a, a university in Canada where he's, he wasn't a physics professor, you would think, he was a chemistry professor. And uh, a friend of mine, University of Arizona State Professor Gordon uh, Don Godfrey wrote about Farnsworth and Benson and, and Jenkins from his books. And this book won the Television Taylor Award, which is hardly given to this, this, this is from the AWA, the Antique Wireless Association, of which we are affiliated, and we got the Taylor Award for this book. Yeah. You can buy it at Amazon, you can go on front page of our website and click on television yeah. uh, on the side. Right here. If you buy it there, uh, we're charging ten, $20, which was our, our cost was like $19.99 or something, but uh, we figured we would have more than a $20 bill. Okay, so before we bring on Dr. Science, I want to introduce the brains behind our publishing empire, our publisher and editor, Richard Watts. Richard, stand up. He makes it look good. Okay, uh, I'm done. Well, what I'm gonna tell you about this morning, I've got a lot of camera uh, presentations, but what, what we're gonna start off with is how bad were these original camera tubes? And you can see a whole bunch of them over there, iconoscopes, orthicons, and a bunch of other things. Uh, they were all, they all needed lots of light. And, the, and, and way back in the old days of mechanical television, you could hardly, you could, you could, you could only maybe get pictures outside. Uh, so what they did is they started to meld image intensifiers on all these early tubes. And I'm gonna go through the, some of the, the early tubes and how they stuck image intensifiers on these tubes to make them more sensitive. So just to kind of give you an idea of what an image intensifier is, <coughs> light comes in, it's focused onto a photocathode which emits electrons. The electrons get accelerated toward a, uh, a, a target which generates light and then it comes out so you get light amplification. Sometimes you can put a electron multiplier sort of in the, in the middle of that whole thing. <clears throat> now these image intensifiers have to focus that electrons from the photocathode into the, uh, into the thing that glows. There's two ways to do that. Uh, there's magnetic focusing where you can put the whole thing in a solenoidal field. Uh, the electrons will spiral around the field lines. <clears throat> uh, the picture will get rotated. The, this, this beam of electrons will get rotated in the magnetic field. But you can start off with a flat screen with a, and, and wind up on a flat phosphor. Another way to focus in these things is electrostatic, <clears throat> where you don't have magnetic fields, where you have like electrostatic fields. These generally require curved surfaces. And that's gonna, I'm gonna I'll, I'll come back and show you how this gets in, uh, the requirements get put into the, uh, into the tubes that, uh, that use these. So there's two different ways to do this. Magnetic focus, where the image kind of gets rotated as it goes from the photocathode to the phosphor, <clears throat> or electrostatic, 
where things have to be t curved like that so the geometric distortions are, are, are minimized. So let's start off with the image dissector, Farnsworth's image dissector. Uh, the uh, the uh, image would be focused on a, on a plate. <clears throat> the electrons are emitted from that plate. Uh, so you have basically a, an image of electrons that come off of that plate. There's a solenoidal focus, so this, so this image comes up. <clears throat> and then there's a deflection plate, there's a deflection coil, which take this image just like in a mechanical television and just take a, one of the pixels of that image and puts it into that little hole, and that's the scanning disk. So the thing is really an electronic equivalent of a mechanical television scanner. So the, there's, so the sensitivity is just terrible. If you have 100,000 pixels in your picture, you're doing a pixel at a time. And so, <clears throat> that's, uh, so there's, not a lot, there's not a lot of electrons, a lot, a lot of light for that one pixel. One of the things that Farnsworth did, and other people did, is put in this, in this, uh, in this um, where, the elect where the image comes in the little hole there, an electron uh, a multiplier system, which is a low noise, but the statistics of the electrons that are going into it really determine the signal to noise ratio of this thing. And there's a few electrons at a time, so you can imagine that the shot effect is going to cause a lot of noise in the image. So that, this, is a, this is an example of a non-storage camera device. <clears throat> the next phase where, 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 the, uh, where the, uh, the tube became much more sensitive, much more sensitive than the image detector, is the iconoscope, invented back in the early 20s by Zorkin. It took, uh, this is before he even when he went to RCA, he went to RCA, took 10 years to get the, to get the iconoscope working well enough that it could be used in, in cameras. And I couldn't resist this, particularly this poor cameraman. I wonder how his back felt at the end of the day. <laughs> anyway, the idea here is on the, uh, the, the image is focused on a plate, which, is a, which consists of a bunch, thousands of tiny little disconnected little dots, little silver dots that have a little cesium on it. <clears throat> and so they, they will, uh, they will when, when light hits it, the electrons will, will come off. So a, char a charge distribution on this mosaic reflects the actual uh, image coming in. So you scan it here with the with a beam. This is a this is a destructive readout type of device. You, see, you scan each one of these little 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 globules, and read and and uh, if if the um, if, if if the light is caused electrons to be emitted it'll develop a positive charge. The scanning beam will come back, replenish that charge, and then the, the fact that that charge is being replenished will create a signal on the other side of this, this mica insulator on this, on this plate, and that's the video signal that goes into the, uh, into the video preamp. The problem is, is this one kilovolt beam that's coming in here to this mosaic, splatters enormous number of electrons off of it. They go scattering, they redistribute on the rest of the mosaic. The efficiency of this uh, device is only about 5% of theoretical, about 5%. So they're, they're, they're more sensitive than the image of sector, but not a lot more, not a lot more sensitive. So what can be done? Well, what the Brits did is the Brits put a image intensifier right in front of it. It's a magnetically focused image intensifier right in front. So you now focus the image on the plate. Uh, the electrons travel through onto the mosaic. There's magnetic focusing here. And uh, that actually increases the efficiency of this thing by about a factor of 10. It's sensitivity by about a factor of 10. Now, the uh, Brits called the iconoscope the Emitron, EMI, for Electrical Musical in Industries. It's a big Brit uh, congl technical conglomerate. And so the, uh, with the addition of the electron multiplier here, they called it the super, the super Emitron. The Brits used these cameras through about the middle of the 1960s, long after in the United States here, all the cameras had been converted over to image orthicons. The, uh, the, em the Emitron and the Super Emitron, since they are iconoscopic, are much more stable camera. Orthicons are a bitch. 
to keep running. Oh, okay, you want me to talk like that. Okay, if you look at these cameras, you'll notice that the, uh, where the electron gun is, it's a little bit off center. And why is it off center? It's because of the, this magnetically focused image multiplier right here rotates the picture by the time it gets to the mosaic. And so when you look at pictures of these British cameras, if you notice that the, that the gun is off center, it's got a super emitron in it. And this was a very popular, very popular camera. And here is some of the, these, 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 this glassware that the Brits were using. It's just wonderful to look at these guys. Just one, just look, look, just wonderful. Here's the inside of the camera. Okay, so, so what happened next? The um, iconoscope had this problem with the high energy beam, one a kilovolt scanning beam, reading the mosaic, all the splashing of the electrons coming out. And so the solution was, let's do, instead, of, instead of interrogating the um, mosaic with a high energy beam, let's inter interrogate it with an energy with a beam that has an energy of about a few electron volts. A few electron volts is low enough that it's not going to cause secondary electrons to be generated. So it, it really solves the secondary electron problem. So, uh, and, and also, uh, you can also make it so that you can actually hit the mosaic from behind, which makes for a little more convenient mechanical uh, uh, configuration for the camera. So a beam is launched from the cathode back here, a uh, few hundred volts, but then it's decelerated to just a few volts by the time it hits, this, uh, it hits the mosaic. The image that's coming in is causing electrons to be emitted from the uh, photocathode. And so there's a charge distribution on the photocathode that, 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 that duplicates the, uh, the, the uh, optical, the, the picture that's being uh, presented. And so the electrons that come in, uh, they are slow enough that depending on the amount of charge that's accumulated here, and this is a, this is a storage type device, uh, the um, electron beam will either hit, has enough energy, just enough energy to hit the target, or if there's enough negative charge on the target, the electron beam will be repelled back, okay? So whether the electrons hit the target or not, the target on the other side of the target is a transparent uh, electrode. That's where the video signal comes from, that transparent electrode, okay? <clears throat> but it's a very low velocity scanning. We've gotten rid of the secondary electron problem in the orthicon. So of course, if you have an orthicon, you have an image orthicon. So the same idea, except now they've put, uh, we've put an image intensifier selection, a section right in front of the, of the, uh, of the target here. Here's your photocathode. There's the, the electron image is, is magnetically focused. This is a big, long solenoid. The magnetic uh, image is focused onto, the, uh, onto this target. It's a rather complicated target, actually. It's a target. There's a very fine wire mesh in front of it to, to, to gather up those photoelectrons that are, that are knocked off. A low energy scanning beam comes. By the time it gets over here, it has an energy of just a few electron volts. It will either hit the target, depending on the charge of the target, depending on how much light is there, or it will either hit the target or get reflected back. Okay, get turned around and get reflected back. And so why doesn't it go right back in that little hole where, the, where it's coming out of? There's a, there's a little alignment coil here, which actually the beam that comes back doesn't go through the little hole where it came out of it. It goes actually to a five-stage photomultiplier electron multiplier, and that's the video signal that comes out of the orthicon. Now, the orthicons are really, uh, as I say, a bitch to keep running. They are very delicate uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, just setting it up, keeping them going, okay? So, the next thing, oh, oh, yeah, let me see. Here's something I found I couldn't believe. A two-stage in image intensifier, image orthicon, RCA came up with. I, can you imagine what that might be? <laughs> I, I couldn't find any more information on that. Okay, so the next thing is the Viticon. How do Viticons work? A little bit different. Uh, in the Viticon, this, this target now is what's called a, is a photoconductor. It's simply something that when light hits it, it becomes more conductive, okay? It's very simple. It, it has, a, it, it, by nature, it has a storage 
capability, so it, so it stores the beam, it's the non-destructive readout. The scanning beam hits it at a fairly low velocity, and, the, and, and, and in places where in that, photo, that photocathode have a lower or higher conductivity, lower resistance because of the light hitting it, uh, the electron beam basically, basically completes its circuit, and here's your, the video signal comes right off of that photo, right off that photocathode. So, uh, the, um, and so what, what can we do with this? What we can do with this is this. And in fact, here, I'll pass that one around. This is a, this is a intensified silicon target Viticon, where the, here, here is your Viticon. The target in this, the target in this thing is not a photocathode, but in fact it's a, an array of thousands and thousands of individual transistors, silicon transistors, all separate. And here is the image section. And you can see here, this is an electrostatically focused image section right here. You see the curved surface right here, required because it's an electrostatically focused device. But lenses want to put a, a, a um, image on a flat surface. So if you look at this thing, this part right here is an optical, is a coherent optical fiber. Thousands of optical fibers are fused together. <clears throat> the uh, image is put on a polished front surface, transmitted through the fiber to this, to this curved surface right here, where's, where, where the photocathode is focused electrostatically onto the uh, field mesh, which in fact, in this case, is a silicon target, thousands and thousands of silicon transistors, and then the rest of it is Viticon-like. So that's really where it all wound up. I just wanted to show you some of the uh, tubes in my uh, own collection, and that, I think, would be it. Thank you. And that took, well, four, and that took 15 minutes. For stickiness and lag? Yes. The, in, in the, yes. What, what, what Jill is asking is why the Viticons have this lag in it. This photoconductor, it's a compromise <clears throat> between the sensitivity the, and, the, and the, uh, the, res the resistance, you know, uh, of spreading a charge into other areas on the same photo uh, the same photoconductor so it's a, so there it, it, it's a it's a it's a compromise between sensitivity and the um, the ability to discharge that uh, you know from the previous scan discharge the charge was built up It's a time constant, right? Because this is this is a a, a high resistance, and there's a capacitance, and so is that RC a time constant of that capacitance, uh, uh, coupled with the the actual chemistry. There are various types of chemistry that are used for the uh, photoconductor of uh, Viticons. So what improvements did they make in the plumbicon to address that? Better chemistry. Chemistry of the photoconductor, and then there's 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 satacons, you know, which are uh, ammon uh, what um, uh, antimony and selenium and that kind of stuff, and so it was just there was just playing with the chemistry <coughs> of the photoconductor, which is which are where the improvements were made, not fundamental of the tube, it's just improvements in the photoconductor itself. Any other questions? Well, this this particular this the the, the this, this the the image intensified satacon uh, actually found its use mainly in things like ast astronomy, where you had to have a very uniform surface because they're actually measuring the actual magnitude of stars with these things, and so uh, it turned out that these satacons had very good uh, transverse or uniformity across the the. Uh, it's also used in, in medical like. Uh, reading X-ray, you know, reading uh, you know, X-ray, you know, for trying to keep the X-ray radiation of the patient low, <clears throat> and so we wanted to very have a very high sensitivity. Um, but they're used mainly in scientific and industrial. They're not used in commercial broadcasting. And as, and as I said, the 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 um, the, uh, emetro, the super emetrons were used to, through about the middle 60s in, in England because the 
the iconoscope is basically a very stable uh, image tube. Not very sensitive, but very stable and very easy to use. They warm up fast. They don't, you don't they have very few adjustments. Not like the orthicons, which were tough to keep, keep running right. Uh, any other questions? So, so these days when you want a transparent electrode for uh, an LCD or something, you just give the oxide as the, the favorite material. What did they use at that time for these transparent electrodes? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Denny, you've got. Is it Denny? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these image intensifiers are essentially screens, and so can you comment on the signal to noise of them? Did they degrade it while at the same time providing gain, or was the signal to noise ratio preserved? The uh, the if if we go back to the the, the first slide. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 oops, I think I just totally lost, okay, I, I, I lost the, the, um, uh, the image intensifiers were kind of used, you know, by the military, had microchannel ampl amplifier plates in between, okay, so, but if you take a look at videos, you know, the, 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 the from between the photocathode and the phosphor, there's a microchannel plate, <coughs> which, uh, uh, does it, I'm not going to take time to explain what a microchannel plate if you don't already know it. But if you take a look at videos that are done with, with image intensifiers, you'll always, uh, you'll always notice that they look kind of noisy because they're using them under the worst possible conditions, you know, moonlit, bare moonlit or starlight. And so that's the only time that I've ever seen real videos uh, used under these conditions, where you're right down to probably the, you know, the quantum, the the the, uh, the, the quantum effects, the uh, the Schottky noise of the of, of what's coming off the photocathode. This is just an aside, but please. You talked about image intensifiers, and I worked on night vision devices in the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. My main concern was the design of the focusing elements, and we did that through computer simulations. And our main concern was spherical aberration. Exactly. And that's why you have these curved surfaces to minimize the pincushion distortion. Denny? Um, question. Yeah, so there's a layer in the Videocon SDI version of a of transistor array. Is it transistor diodes, trans transistors? What are they? Uh, 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 photo they can be phototransistors as well, so the photons coming in actually provide the bias and, and, and are then amplified and cause an electrical signal. They're quite a guy. Okay, the audience. Actually, but they have actually some gain to them. Yeah, I mean, if you want to look at well, it. Well, they have some gain to them, then, yeah, there's transistor action going on. Okay, the, the audience says. Our expert audience that knows actually more about the details than I do, saying they were photodiodes. Yeah. Okay. So, so these uh, cameras using the magnetic focusing, as you mentioned, you get a, you get a rotation of the image. You get a, yeah. Is that a, a finicky thing that needed to be adjusted on these cameras to, to get the image properly marshaled? Well, if you've ever. If you've ever tried to focus even a Viticon camera, which has. Yeah. It rotates. Whenever you have, I mean, and, and the rotation, the picture that I showed, showed showed many, many, many rotations. The rotation is actually just a fraction of a radian, just you know, not very but much, enough but enough, but enough to notice. And when you yeah. when you focus, run the magnetic focus current up and down on a Viticon camera, or an, or an Orthicon camera, you'll see the image rotating just like that. You do have to tweak that. You do have to tweak that. That's right. So in the orthogon camera, the you know the the whole the whole yoke assembly, you know, is pivotable. So you can the the super emitrons, It looked like it was more or less fixed. You know, were that off center. You know, so they they had to do it right to begin with. Okay, well, let's move on.
Yeah, if there are no further questions, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I thought let's take just a moment right now, and something I neglected to do earlier. I think it's worth it to spend a moment to introduce ourselves. Not everybody knows everybody here, and it would be great to, to, to hear just a <coughs> word or two about where you come from and what your background in this is. Uh, we don't need a whole sermon, just a little sort of thing. Uh, but let's start with John. Oh, good. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I'm a physicist. My PhD is in nuclear physics, and I've been with the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory since 1971, and I make particle accelerators. And so that's basically my profession. Been interested in television since I was a kid. My first real television was my RCA 630, which I got when I was probably about 11 or 12 years old. When I was a kid, I worked at the local TV repair shop, <laughs> helping with the, uh, helping with, with the, and our shop had a very good reputation. It was a one-man shop, and the hard sets would come to him, the, the shop, and then they give the shop the sets to me, and that's how I learned television technology back when I was a kid working this. That was great, great experience. Uh, I got my first phone and my uh, amateur extra class licenses back in 1958. Spent a few years in commercial broadcasting, which was really a lot of fun. Finished graduate school, <clears throat> and then after graduate school and postdoc, came to Berkeley in 1971. And so I collect a, um, I don't have a big collection, but I think I have the best TVs. And of course, I've been really interested in cameras because there's a lot of technology associated with cameras. All right, thank you. Thank you. Steve, you want to go next? Uh, Steve here, that's uh, probably the most non-engineer here. I worked for the ABI XT in the city for a number of years, and uh, kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none. All right, Tom, introduce yourself. Okay, I guess I can do that Microphone. as well. Microphone. Yeah, I guess we should pass this around while we're doing that to get the audio. So yeah, I'm Tom Albrecht, and uh, professionally, I guess I'm a, I'm a physicist as well. Uh, I've worked uh, many years in the uh, data storage industry, particularly for hard disk drives. More recently, I've switched fields back to what I did in graduate school, working on a special flavor of atomic force microscope. We don't need to know what the details of that are. Uh, I've been interested in antique electronics since I was a kid, because when I was a kid, which was a few years later than John, uh, the junk that people were throwing away was all this wonderful tube radios and tube televisions, and I was fascinated by it, so I would collect these things and take them home and sometimes get them working and, and often tear them apart to build projects that I could read about in the books at the library, like the, the, the Morgan series, Boy's Book of Radio Electronics, this kind of thing. So I did that kind of stuff, and it has somehow stuck with me all these years, and uh, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, I. I moved from radios to televisions. I still do radios a lot, but uh, uh, it's sort of a new and interesting and a little more challenging uh, technical package to learn about, and I'm still learning about uh, TVs. I do lots of radio and TV restorations for, for customers, and that, that, uh, that way I get to work on these things, but I don't have to have an ever-increasing collection, so I have sort of a small one. So. Okay, uh, Mike? Yes, I'm, I'm Mike Adams. I'm the uh, board chair of California Historical Radio Society. I'm not on the technical end of things. I'm more on the production and content end of things. I, I just remember my, my first TV studio at uh, WOUB TV in Athens, Ohio in 1960 had two Viticon cameras and two image orthicon cameras. And the Viticon cameras you couldn't put on, on tripods because they, they, they just much, whatever you call, call that, uh, they dragged the image along with them. And, and the other camera, required more light than in the entire city of Athens. So, and, and so I'm, I'm a collector and a producer and director and a retired professor, you know, the old professor. Hi, I'm Jim Fink. Uh, been a member here since they moved to Alameda. I went to Alameda High School, native Alameda. So it was very nice for this place to show up about five blocks from my house. So uh, I got my MSWE from San Jose State and uh, was an en avionics engineer at Naval Air Station. And for a number of years, I taught uh, electronics through the apprentice programs. And uh, when I retired, when they closed the base down, I kept it with a hobby. I've been, you know, since probably 10 years old, my neighbors 
used to give me their old dilapidated radios, and I would take all the parts and, uh, you know, try to make something new out of a cardboard box with the original knobs. And I actually got stuff to work. It was fun, but it's been a hobby all my life. So uh, I'm glad they're just down the street, and I'm keeping my fingers in the pie and uh, having a good time at it. Oh, yeah. I won the, uh, uh, of the year award. yeah, the Volunteer of the Year Award, so now I'm a lifetime member. I don't have to pay my stinking dues every year. <laughs> I'm Joe Selkraig, and uh, I've been with the club since, I think, the mid-'80s. Um, I've always liked anything with a cathode ray tube in it. It doesn't matter what it is. I, I probably have 100 tech scopes and, and lots of televisions. Um, I worked at Amdahl, if anybody remembers that company, for 15 years. And uh, now I'm currently working as an instrument control tech, control tech at the San Jose sewer plant, <laughs> of all places. Um, and I'm really into radio, to anything electronic, uh, any, anything vintage. Um, anyway, I guess that, that pretty well covers it. Thanks. You know, somebody asked me recently, and I went and counted them, and I have a minimum of 40. Do they all work? Oh, of course they all work, yeah. Well, it was either me or the, or the, the wife or the TVs. And, well, the sideways. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Gilles Vrigno. I'm on my fourth nation nationality, French, Australian, Canadian, and American. I apprenticed in radio and television in Tasmania. I hate to think how many interesting and wonderful radio sets I pulled apart for bits and pieces. I wish I had them now. But I worked most of my life in cable television and broadcast television and enjoyed it very much. And uh, my wife once, uh, one day said, you know, you should join that group you keep talking about. And I think she's regretted it now. <laughs> anyway, that's me. Uh, I'm Rob Johnson. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been collecting stuff for a long time. I kind of started out on uh, radio a little bit and then went more into music stuff. So uh, guitar amplifiers, hi-fi stuff, uh, vintage synthesizers, uh, I've built modular synthesizers, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, professionally, um, you know, I've been in high tech, uh, spent a decade at Apple uh, doing hardware engineering stuff, uh, QA stuff. I uh, worked on Adobe Premiere for a few years. Now I'm at uh, NVIDIA, uh, still doing uh, professional application stuff. Um, several years ago, I ended up with a, a lot of you guys know Jerry Grolke. I ended up with his collection. Uh, so I've been trying to do stuff with that. Uh, that's about 350 sets. Uh, so it's a lot to work with. But one of these days, I'm going to get around to cataloging and doing all that stuff. But anyway, that's, um, that's my story, so. Hi, my name is Kurt Swanson. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, I spent the first half of my career with Motorola Communications and the second half as a, an engineering consultant and designing electrical systems for the aerospace industry, um, uh, missiles and satellites. I've had a strong interest in old-time radio and TV since I was a kid. My first set of interest was a Spartan TV 4900, which is a mirror in the lid 10-inch set. And my second set was an RCA CTC4. I had a, always had a real fascination with color TV as well. Uh, several of you were at my house several years ago, and I have, you saw some of the sets I've, I've got, obviously, and I've I've got several uh, first-generation color TVs that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, while I was in college, I maintained the transmitter for our local PBS affiliate, KVIE, in uh, Walnut Grove, California. So I do have some actual professional experience. I've been when I was in high school, I got both a, my ham radio ticket and my first phone. So I'm I've done some of that kind of stuff too. And I've also had a lifetime interest in uh, hi-fi and music, so. 
that's that's who I am. Okay, I'm uh, Chuck Johnson. I'm alias uh, N6VFH per the FCC. Uh, I'm my I'm sort of auditing the course here. Uh, I've got a connection to the what's called the Silicon Valley uh, Amateur Television Group, which has its uh, repeater on Loma Prieta Mountain, puts out a monstrous signal out there for us to check out on the uh, weekly nets and so forth. But uh, in general, we've had the luxury of a number of years here to have the gentleman on my right to give uh, some TV history, TV technology overview that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise in spite of my ham radio affiliations and so forth. So I'm very thankful for the hospitality that this group has uh, provided to me with the various uh, events that we've had, uh, uh, swap meets and uh, radio days. And we were at uh, the Hornet uh, a while back there for radio day on the bay and so forth, so uh, we're very grateful to have access to this uh, organization and expertise and the uh, wonderful uh, exhibits here that, are, that we can check out uh, when we visit. So in any event, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to partake of this uh, wonderful knowledge. So over we go, thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Richard Deal and I, my alias in the world is uh, Lab Guy. If you look for me on the web, uh, I have a website called Lab Guys World where I document uh, videotape recorders of the, uh, yeah, well I have a YouTube channel too, I'll get to that, um, where I document videotape recorders that predate Betamax and VHS. Uh, generally the industrial stuff, um, the idea being this is stuff I could have potentially owned back when I couldn't afford to own it. and. Uh, and then uh, once that collection just became a huge monster, uh, I decided to start building replicas of systems like mechanical television and different scan rate TVs and other demonstrators for video processes and techniques. And so I built uh, the two televisions that you'll see here today. Uh, they're operating in the 32-line uh, mechanical TV standard of the NBTV organization in England, but also I uh, was using the Aurora World Converter, and um, I designed my own signal generator for NBTV because the World Converter is not available, and it's hideously expensive. Uh, most of my viewers on YouTube gripe that the thing's too expensive. So I, I designed a signal generator and two mechanical displays, which I brought today. But also in my collection is a, a CBS field sequential color replica um, and a, um, a trinoscope television, which I built with one inch picture tubes to uh, keep the thing rather compact. Oh, not come today. no Chris so today. Okay. Okay. And I'm also a member of the Amateur TV Club in San Jose, uh, KJ6RNL. I got my amateur license just so I could run amateur TV and nothing else. Hi, I am Jerry KB60. I was born in Czech Republic, and um, as a kid or teenager, I start, started building all my own uh, uh, crystal sets and radios and uh, uh, then got even a uh, ham license. Then I got drafted into uh, the, the Czech Armed Forces. I was a radar technician there. And uh, then later, um, I um, moved, well, actually I had to escape from Czechoslovakia, it was a communist country, it was a terrible place to live, and uh, so came in here and uh, worked uh, as an electronic technician for the port of San Francisco, and um, what else, um, as a member of uh, uh, on Diablo Radio Club, I got into ATV, amateur TV, and I've been doing that for a good 25 years. 
And um, so you can actually see me every, uh, every Thursday uh, on, uh, uh, actually the uh, uh, MDARC Radio Club uh, uh, also uh, streams the um, uh, TV, uh, ATV uh, gathering online so everybody can see it uh, on their computer. And so, um, yeah, that's how I got into uh, television uh, through the amateur television. Uh, that's about it. Hello, everyone. I'm Barry McMullen. Uh, let's see, I went to work on Wall Street 40 years ago, and uh, right now I'm a vice president for UBS in San Francisco, managing money for people and uh, institutions, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But uh, before uh, Wall Street, I was a pilot for Eastern Airlines. They went bankrupt. PSA, they went bankrupt. United Airlines, they went bankrupt. And so uh, I had to switch careers. Before that, <laughs> Before that, I was uh, a double E. I worked for uh, Sylvania. Uh, we were uh, designing uh, some of the first solid state radios for helicopters. And uh, uh, let's, so uh, in high school, I was 14 years old and uh, worked at the TV shop repairing TVs. And I, I guess that basically meant just changing tubes. And uh, I have a question for all of you. Somebody said in the old days, you know, these high voltage sections produce x-rays, and I'm waiting for the effects to catch up with me. But I, I'm wondering, is that true? And like my mercury vapor rectifier tubes from my ham radio, you know, do they generate some kind of x-rays? So maybe somebody knows, you know, <laughs> the story on that stuff. And uh, thanks, everyone, for putting this together. This is, this is great. Hi, I'm Ron Code, and I guess I have a couple unique characteristics I bring with me. First of all, I drove three and a half hours to get here this morning. No, keep your applause. <laughs> uh, I never had a degree in engineering, although I have one in math. My whole in, uh, professional life has been in computers. I should have retired many years ago, but I still am dabbling with former customers and so on. I got interested in radio, like many of you, I worked in a radio shop, I took the course, those home courses that were available, I bought my first tube caddy when I was 17, and uh, I came across a television in, in Carson City, Nevada, in an old hotel there, and it was for sale, $80, and, and that was th about 28 years ago, it was an RCA 630, and the sign on it said, uh, 19... Uh, 50s TV, and I said, I know better than that. This was this was the bread and butter TV for learning about TV. So I started, and then it got out of control, of course, you know. And so I suppose I have about 30 sets right now. Uh, almost all of them have been restored. I don't believe in having a bunch of, I, you know. In fact, the problem is, what are you going to do with the ones I know I'm not going to restore? So there you have it. I'm Richard Watts, and I'm here with CHRS. I had um, the prerequisite interest as a kid in electronics, and that just sort of always been a thread uh, for me. Um, after I got out of the Air Force, I went to college at night, and while I was doing that, I worked as a bench technician in a TV repair shop for most of a decade. And uh, I also built my first computer in 1975. So. Um, so uh, when I graduated, I wandered off into computers and left electronics on the shelf for a while. And when I graduated from Lawrence Livermore Lab, I wanted to do something to keep me off the streets. And, and so I just uh, started restoring antique radios. I found this place, and here I am. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the book. <laughs> So, Danny? Drop the disguise here. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Dennis Monticelli, I'm interested in all things scientific. Um, double E, 40 years in the semiconductor industry, um, background solid state physics and, and circuits, um, and, and now retired. Um, I loved hearing the stories about how you guys got started fixing stuff up. Uh, because same thing with me, and I had one of those, you know, radio flyers, you know, those red wagons. Went around the neighborhood and uh, collected up old radios that people were getting rid of uh, to fix it for them. I thought I could turn it into a little business. So I went home, I'd fix them up, and then I'd pile the little radio flyer, you know, with radios, and then I'd go back to the neighborhood, and I'd return them one by one. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the people would uh, take the radio and they were surprised. And they said, oh, we didn't really um, expect you to fix it. I'll tell you what, in lieu of money, why don't you just keep it as a gift? <laughs> so I, I was actually forced into collecting is what, is what happened. OK, who's next? Vern. Yes. Yes, my name's uh, Vern Hake, KJ6OG. I'm a uh, retired radio operator from the Merchant Marines. We got 27.5 uh, uh, years as a uh, Merchant Mariner, various jobs. And that's from ordinary seaman to uh, AB, bosun, and then finally a radio operator. And I had a little short stint uh, with the San Francisco Bar Pilots, where I was a boat jockey with a 100-ton license for the... for. Uh, the San Francisco bar pilots. And I only, I, I live three blocks down. This is my haven. I am, I'm, I'm the unofficial security guard uh, for Chris as I come down here periodically uh, uh, early in the morning. But uh, yes, it's uh, been a pleasure to, to be a member here. An yeah, honor. And Steve, you're next. Uh, Steve Cushman, uh, San Francisco native, spent uh, three and a half years at a two-year school, San Francisco City College, because I got so wrapped up in radio, and I loved it so much. Uh, worked then after that at KEMO, Channel 20, on and off for a couple of years, and then uh, hooked up with uh, KGO, Channel 7 in 1977, officially retired 15 years ago, and then for the last uh, 13 years of that, uh, I worked, uh, I went back and did exactly what I did on a part-time basis for KGO, and I started out in videotape operations uh, from two-inch quad machines Ampex uh, VTRs, uh, 1,200 uh, and 2,000s, then AVR3s, and then we went to one inch Ampex VPRs, and then three quarter inch. And uh, my main occupation there has been a video editor, uh, first in production, and then for the last 20 or so years in news. And now, uh, because of COVID, I am fully retired. I've been president of this outfit since 1996, and uh, it's my, it's, uh, you know, it's a passion. It's what we do, and we have wonderful, wonderful volunteers and members and supporters, and uh, for a little niche organization, we are doing great, and uh, we really value everyone's support. And if you're not members, we have applications that you could fill out when you leave. All right. So that, that's great to. Uh, it's great to hear a little bit from everyone here. You really are a wonderful and very interesting bunch of people. So that's what makes it fun to get together. Okay, we'll be a little bit dynamic with the schedule then, since Chris is not here. That's too bad. I was really looking forward to learning more about ATV, but I understand there's a number of ATV people here, so we'll talk at the breaks and learn more about that. So, so with that then, we'll move to, to Richard Deal, and uh, looking forward to Thank you, Tom. seeing what you've got to tell us. All right. I'll just get up here where I can see all of you. Hello, I'm Richard Deal. Um, 
Today I've uh, brought my two uh, uh, NBTV televisor displays and my uh, NBTV signal generator, uh, and I'll tell you why I built them. Um, the, the mechanical display I built because I wanted to see one running, and it was generally the only way I could see one when I wanted to see one and not have to go to a museum somewhere to see it. And um, so I, I built the um, NBTV Club uh, reference design from their website, and it's, it's running over here, but um, I colorized it. They, normally, they'll, they'll put a, a single color light source on it, either a, either a neon bulb for traditional, the traditional look, uh, but LEDs are super popular today. And I uh, built this one to accept RGB video to the light box and the, the, uh, the, de the, the monochrome signal with the sync pulses goes to the servo to lock the disc. It, it's still a work in progress. I have some work to do to it. Uh, it currently cannot display a single monochrome signal. It can only display anything with a color signal. Or I, I could Jeep it, I guess, where I feed the, I could tap the input and feed it into all three light channels on the color box, but I, I'm not bothering to do that yet. Is it the sync from the disc, or you generate well, separately? Now, the, the, the video generators, okay, I'll get into the format of NBTV for those who aren't familiar. Um, in Logie Baird's original system was 30 lines running at 12 and a half frames per second. And they, in recent history, whatever that is, 20 or 30 years ago, the NBTV club started and they uh, settled on 32 lines because of digital advantage that, that way, six bits makes 32, so they, they used that. And so I copied the club standard and uh, built the monitor. And uh, the, the signal consists of 32 scan lines, continuous at 400 hertz, the, the horizontal sync, the line sync pulses, which the lines are vertical by the nature of the mechanical system, um, is 400 hertz and the frame rate's 12 and a half hertz. And, um, and so the, the flicker is noticeable on it. And uh, it's one thing we all know to read about old TV technology. Oh, this camera was so terrible and this one was better. And, and you read about it and especially if two or three people are describing the same uh, situation, you can get three totally different stories. One person loved it, one person wasn't impressed, and the other one just hates it, you know, whatever. So um, I build these things so that I could see them. So I, the, f the first thing I built was the, was the um, mechanical TV you see here, and uh, along with it, because of my work in antique television technology, I bought a world converter. I think Daryl Hawk, is that the guy? Uh, Daryl Hawk used to build those. He does not build them anymore. Um, and then they weren't cheap. They're over $1,000 for the scan converter. And it will produce all of the obsolete. You, you put conventional video in, you get all the obsolete scanning standards, half a dozen mechanical standards and a dozen or more electronic standards come out of it. it the, the world converter also contains an agile modulator. So if you've got a very, very early TV that runs at 240 lines and has a particular receiver, that box will generate the actual signal that receiver wants to see on the correct frequency. It, it, it's an amazing box. I don't know how he builds them for $1,000. I, I don't know how he did that. So back to uh, my projects, I post my projects on YouTube where I'm known as Video Lab Guy, that just because Lab Guy got taken, I guess. And, um, and what started to fall out from my comments section was people were complaining that I have the world converter, which does give me a very unfair advantage, which I'm very proud of, because without it, none of this would be happening. And so in response to that, I constructed a very straightforward and lower cost. I wouldn't say it's cheap, cheap. Uh, you could probably build one if you bought all the parts, build it for less than $300. Um, it's a simple memory-based frame buffer that contains 256 NBTV pictures. 
because the picture is at 32 scan lines and I give each scan line 64 pixels, each picture takes 2K in monochrome. So I built the frame buffer with triple buffers, so there's red, green, and blue, and then using a program I wrote in BASIC, um, I take the images and paint shop, and I, I process them to size, then I, it has to open the files and write them into the memory chip file, and then I burn them on a, on a programmer. It's not convenient to do, but you can put up to 256 of your favorite still pictures in this generator if you copy it. Uh, it's, it's a very simple system. Like I say, the, the frame buffers are very simple, and it's audio bandwidth. I mean, it requires you know, no super tech. And uh, I built the state machine uh, to run it uh, from a four megahertz crystal. So I use extremely huge memory chips for the timing generator, which gives me what's called the granularity of the timing. I, I can move timing edges on very small nanosecond increments. <laughs> for a system that would tolerate microseconds. But that's just the way I build things. Then I got the, um, the, the CRT monitors based on the um, uh, James Millen Company's one-inch oscilloscope modules they sold in the 50s and up into the 60s. And I got one on eBay a few years ago. And it's been quite the dust collector in the bookcase. And I decided I would build a mechanical display around that CRT. And so that was the foundation for the uh, CRT televisor. Uh, and uh, that went together within, I think, 10 days, I built that whole unit. And uh, the mechanical TV, I worked on it a while. I had built my own servo for the motor, and it was crap. And so I uh, broke down, and I built the club circuit and turned it on. The thing just came up running and locked right up. And I said, OK, yeah, I know when to give up on certain things. And so I, I had constructed the two displays, which got good response on YouTube, which brought up the, the, the problem with the generator for most people. Um, in the world of NBTV, there's some software for the computer that outputs video from the sound card, and the results vary dramatically. It depends on the sound card, um, the people writing the software. Um, I was not gratified by the computer-based signals I was getting. And so that's why I, I built my own generator and uh, built it to uh, standard definition broadcast standards, I guess. Uh, I, I do 75 ohm termination where the, the club doesn't because their, their sources are usually sound cards, tape recorders, a radio receiver because it's literally audio bandwidth and so on. And so when I build my equipment, my generator is a 75 ohm, one volt peak to peak output. You go to the club and try to find a spec for a termination resistance and a, and a uh, voltage, nothing. It can be anywhere from a volt, half a volt, three volts, whatever that person's machine builds. So they put in big, broad range contrast controls for that, I guess. I don't know. So the purpose of my construction was to show people uh, what, what the stuff actually looks like versus reading about it. Uh, your bomb camera, the, the iconoscope camera came from me. When I first got that thing making pictures, I had read about how terrible iconoscope tubes were all those years and everything. And yeah, they're not the greatest tube in the world. Far from terrible. They, it actually, I was blown away by the quality of the picture. And the absence of lag, which nobody seemed to talk about in the iconoscope, it has its other issues. It gets shading when it's, it's overlit and, and over, uh, the beam is too high and stuff. But anyways, so uh, that's pretty much the story of these three objects. Um, I just like building um, video devices, either generators, cameras, and, and other devices. Currently, I'm constructing an NBTV camera using a tube. And um, well, it, it needed to be 1920s appropriate. And I happen to own several image dissector tubes, actual image dissectors. I think they're late 60s vintage. They're from uh, uh, IT&T, where Farnsworth when he retired, he was a, a chief scientist or something, some title like that. Uh, and they bought his patents. 
and uh, they, they continued to make these tubes, and they used them for really interesting applications. Uh, star trackers on satellites, uh, they were considered high reliability, they don't have a heater, and, and so on. So uh, in digging around, I found a tube called an FW-130 that is probably ideal for the experimenter who wants to get it going, because if you keep shopping, you can get the uh, base with the divider resistors and everything to power up the tube. It will operate, a, an image dissector with no deflection coils on it will operate just like a photomultiplier. It will pick up light. So um, you add the scanning part and then you can scan your image. Well, the FW-130, don't hold me to this, but I swear it's out of the nose of a heat-seeking missile. Um, the thing's built like a Coca-Cola bottle, for one thing. The glass is at least a quarter inch thick. This thing's a, just a monster of uh, mechanical construction. And, uh, with the base unit, you, you give it high voltage and it says right on it, 1,000 volts. You put 1,000 volts in, you have a cathode output, feed that to an op amp, and you, start, you can start getting pictures out of it. And so I'm building an NBTV camera, which is the long, this long-winded spiel, uh, that will go with my ensemble here eventually. But it's not ready to use yet. But I have been getting pictures out of it. Uh, I display them on the oscilloscope while I debug the tube. And currently I have probably four or five image dissectors. And I have gotten pictures out of the uh, FW-130 tube on several occasions. Uh, basically, what I do with that is I, I've got it breadboarded on the bench, and I'm feeding it with two audio uh, uh, function generators. I just feed it triangle waves, pipe it to the oscilloscope, and I have the little Felix the cat that I bought just for this, and it's, I finally am getting room light images from this tube running at this speed. Uh, the, there's the downside of a dissector tube. It's a great, it's a great imaging tube. It really is for everything, except television. <laughs> it, the faster you scan it, the less sensitive it is. Uh, it has to do with uh, John mentioned it, the dwell time on, per pixel, because it's an instantaneous readout of any point in the in the image. Um, and if you're scanning, let's say you're scanning at TV rate, and your pixel is 250 nanoseconds. Your beam is only on the pixel for 250 nanoseconds every 16 milliseconds. So you, you've got no signal, literally no, very few electrons. Um, so, so the NBTV signal is ideal for that too. Yeah, yeah, they're like 11 stage multipliers and they've got a little neck on the top. They look just like a bottle, okay? It comes up with a big body and then necks down to a little neck which the deflection coil goes around. It's the imaging section. They're not high resolution tubes. Like I said, I think all they look for is a laser dot on something. <laughs> and then when you adjust the scanning to center the image, it turns the fins on the missile. But very clever, you gotta think about the 60s. This would have been analog computing and, and so on. So, and I, I, I've only deduced, not, deduced this. I know none of this to be fact because they're not publishing it for some reason. They don't trust us. So anyways, um, the NBTV camera is under construction right now and uh, is already making pictures. It just isn't a complete standalone camera yet or it'd be here today too, along with Felix and uh, Spud. I have these two toys that I use for my models just like um, uh, Baird would have used in his time because I can't get my roommates to sit still in front of the camera. So uh, I use the two two puppets, and one is a Mr. Potato Head, nicknamed Spud, and the other is a Felix the Cat that I bought on eBay. It's a plushie. I tried to buy an original rubber Felix the Cat from the 20s. The cameras are cheaper. <laughs> so, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, and if you, if you confront me about it, I'll deny it all. That's, my name's Richard Deal, and thank you for listening. Any questions? That's a good question. It, it, you would think it would reduce flicker, but it doesn't really. Um, the, the, the decay curve of a phosphor is such that um, 
It probably does 90% of its decay very rapidly, even a long persistence phosphor. And so even though it does retain an image like slow scan TV, you'll still see it flickering. You will see the update beam flashing at the same rate and it's just as annoying. Yeah. yeah, so I, I have tried slower scan stuff on P7 tubes, and um, it, it's, it's awful. It, it can be done, and you know, if you had to use one for an image. Yeah, yeah, that's a two-stage phosphor. Okay, uh, it's a two-stage two phosphor, but um, the blue is fast and the yellow is long, and, and uh, yellow or green, I've seen them in both shades. Um, so, um, yeah, a longer persistence phosphor wouldn't hurt, but what I found the best way to get good images of that is to photograph it with a, uh, a long shutter, faster than uh, 1 12 and a half of a second, 40 milliseconds. You set it probably, you know, anything less than that, or, or longer than that, and you'll get, a, you'll get a solid picture. And they look great. The, the still, when I post the stuff on the web, even on YouTube, I, I use still images because trying to photograph it, I, I've tried 24 frame per second mode on my camera. Uh, I've tried uh, a, a European camera at 25 frames and a, an American camera at 30. None of them work. It just doesn't work. There is one trick that I took with those photos of her head downstairs on, a, on an Apple iPhone. It's the burst mode. Hmm. So you keep on pressing the button. At some point, you can get lucky and you don't get the bar. Right, the right, right. I've, I've tried to do it with this, with my phone camera, and I have very bad results. My phone camera is just too sensitive, and so I get s little strips of picture. Um, my old camera, I could slow down the ISO setting, and then uh, it would take a longer exposure until I was getting a single frame, and that's how you can do that. Uh, Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, the, 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 the dissector tubes I have are exceptionally linear, just uh, photomultipliers are very linear. Um, the, the slope of the linearity will remain straight, but as you adjust the bias on the multipliers, you'll, you'll change the, the gain slope, right, the transfer function. But otherwise, it's, it's a very straight line from end to end. Yeah, Richard is exactly correct. Until you get to the point where you actually start drawing current in the last stage or two, it starts dragging the glass diamonds down. Yep. Before you get to that point, photomultipliers are really linear. There's no, it's not, there's, there's no avalanche at all. Yeah. It's, not, it's not an avalanche process. It's a secondary. It's just a secondary emission process, and uh, and, and, and and very low noise. I mean, you know, the as applied to the original Farnsworth uh, image dissector. There was no vacuum tube amplifier that, that could even approach the noise floor of a photom of a, of a multiplier chain. But no, it's of course, that they are in fact very linear, but it's something yeah, kind but, of expected. But, but of course, yeah, you're limited by the statistics of the electrons going up to the first dynode, and there aren't very many electrons in each pixel, and so it's the uh, statistical variation, the number, uh, you know, but. but the, 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 you, you can electro, you can individually electron count in, in a photomultiplier chain. Right. Well, the, the FW 130s that I bought, when I bought them, they came with the base units and the and the cryogenic chamber, which I stripped off and I recycled that. But um, they. Uh, but they, they, when, they, when you want to me measure single photons with these sensors, you must refrigerate them. They, they, they are definitely cold, but I don't run them that way. I run them at room temperature, at reasonable light levels, and, I, and they're, they're working good for me. So uh, one last thing about the image dissectors that I collected. I got some two-inch two -inch diameter tubes that are about this long. I got two of them. One of them has gold plating in the front with a series of slits. I don't know what that's about. I, it's either some sort of a position sensing 
or an interference grating for something. But I don't know. There is no explanation. There's no number on these tubes, no brand or anything. The other one is a complete imager. And unfortunately, it's opaque by carbon uh, aquadag on the inside. And you can't see inside to pin it out, to candle it and get the pin out. So I sent it up to, um, to Washington State to a company up there that does CAT scanning of industrial devices. And I got it CAT scanned for free and got it back. And so I have a 3D CAT scan that I can rotate and look at. And I've got it all pinned out. I know what the electrodes are inside now. So now I need to wind yokes and focus coils. And, and like your image orthicon, it's going to be a hunt. You know, it's not like you turn them on and they come right up running, you know. But, um, but my, back, back to the last point I was making was that um, out of all my tubes, I have one that's in a Viticon format. And then I have the FW-130s. And I've already gotten pictures out of two of these tubes. No data sheets. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, that, that was, I, I actually, way back when I did an Excel file that would let me change the number of holes and the spacing and aspect ratio and everything. I didn't have it perfected yet. And I had sent the data generated for the club disk to a company called Pololu in Las Vegas. And they do um, manufacturing you know, for hobbyists and stuff. They, this was probably eight years ago. They would do 3D printing for you if you didn't have a 3D printer. They'd do machining and stuff. So that's where you ordered your custom-made parts. And so I had them make me a disc out of polyethylene, and the stupid thing would just, just flop around in the wind. It was useless. So I, I bolted it to the record and then just drilled right through the holes and uh, made the record. It, when you look at the, that record, you'll see that I got the width a little too wide. I don't, I don't have the aspect ratio perfect, but it doesn't matter. It, it proves the principle. How did you actually, because I've done the same thing, how do you actually get your holes in the correct spacing, angular spacing between them? Well, that's what I said. It was all done in the spreadsheet and calculated. And well, they, I mean, once, but then you have to actually locate the, where you put the holes. Right. Well, what I did is I took the disk they made for me, which they probably made on some sort of CNC. Oh, they had, laser cut it for oh, me. Uh, yeah. I, I, I had, yeah, I had the, had the disc made, but it, the material I had chosen was too floppy. It just, it fluttered in the wind. And so it was useless, but it was a perfect template. So I put a quarter 20 bolt right through the middle of both discs, the, the record and, and that disc, and just very carefully drilled it with the tiniest drill bread I had. And that's how I made that disc. And I used a, a six hole little hub that they sell and I sat there for days doing the eccentricity to get that disc centered so that thing wouldn't dance off the table. Getting it balanced was a nightmare. And so when I handle it, I handle it very gingerly. The frame is tense to torque, and, uh, it, and then the disc rattles against the photo sensors and stuff. One thing about the disc, you asked about the sink. The, the sink is 32 sink pulses, sink pulse positions, and for frame sink, they leave one sink pulse out. So what I did for the, for the optical holes, which you'll see this, the light sensor on the bottom of the disc there, I put my holes around the outside of the disc for the highest spatial resolution. And then uh, I drilled 31 holes. I left one out. And so the disc generates a feedback signal identical to the video sync. And I feed that just to a 40, I think it's a 40, 60 something phase comparator chip. And I forget the number. I want to say 4066, but that's a switch. So anyways, um, I built the club servo and hooked that up, and it just came up running. So yeah, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so that, that'll be here running for It's running. I, I've, set, I've set the little CRT monitor up with the camera. So if you get yourself positioned around and we play with the brightness and contrast, you'll be able to see your face on the one-inch tube to a degree. <laughs> All right. There you go, Tom. Thank you. Yet another bomber camera. Well, uh, as, as, you know, Richard, Richard wound up with, uh, with two of these bomber cameras. When I said what we call bomber cameras, these were cameras that were made by RCA back around 1943 to put in the nose of drones or missiles. And uh, they made both the iconoscope-based and or image orthicon-based cameras. 
Richard had one of each, which later he sold to me, and I have uh, continued to, to work with them. But um, you know, having just a working iconoscope camera is really kind of a unique thing. It turned out that, it, that there was another one right here in Alameda that we only found out about very recently. Uh, the um, engineer that I knew back in L at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, a uh, fellow by the name of Don Milberger, he died a number of years ago, but his wife, Shirley, uh, uh, Sheila, got in touch with us a few months ago and said, we've got something here that you might be interested in. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we did. Here we are. If you go a little further, a little further south, uh, this is the camera was sitting in a, a chicken coop or something like that in a backyard, it was, and and we picked it up and brought it in. And you can see what it looked like. This, by the way, this is a non-technical talk, uh, and and, uh, and we we cleaned it up and made it work. Here's how the cameras. Here, here's here's a camera going into this drone right here. Uh, these after the war after the war after Second World War, uh, th these went on the surplus market, and apparently a lot of people bought them. There's another fellow out in the valley that has one. I don't think he's any, done anything with it, but this is what you for for two hundred dollars you could get yourself a, uh, a a working iconoscope camera. So, and here's the the. the uh, the, the uh, schematic, it takes 17 tubes, has a built-in uh, sink generator, totally non-standard sink. The, the horizontal sweep was around 14 kilohertz and the vertical is about four, four, 40 hertz. So, and, and uh, you know, certainly not NTSC or anything like that. Uh, the, um, but totally self-contained, had a high voltage generator, ran the iconoscope. At, a, at about a kilovolt. And over here, you can actually see what was in that camera. This is a four inch iconoscope. It's a ruggedized iconoscope. It's the ones that we're using in this camera. Here's a six inch iconoscope that were used more in, uh, in, the, in the broadcasting industry, in film pickups, and in some of the early, some of the early cameras. So this camera, so this, uh, this, this iconoscope camera, this Bonner camera came in, and here's what it looked like. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was definitely not in, not in very good shape. And here's what it looked like on the inside. Uh, real, a, lot of, a lot of corrosion, really awful looking. This is what happens when you put something out in a garden shed and let it sit out there for 50 years. We don't really know what the history is. But the transformers inside turned out to be good. For which you know those are irreplaceable. Most of the other stuff is uh, off the shelf. So if the transformers are good, the transformers are are the the, um, the high voltage transformer, the vertical uh, the transformer for the vertical deflection, transformer for the horizontal. They were they all turned out to be good. So we started taking it all apart. You can you can <laughs> you can see what it looked like, and. Uh, uh, started starting to clean it up, take, get all this, this corrosion off, uh, strip, strip everything off, strip, strip the paint off. Um, okay, here is the front panel, strip it off, and then start repainting. By the way, the camera, it, it's, it's right here. Here it is. And when you get a chance, you know, just you know, you know, look look inside, see what this thing see what this thing actually looks like. So tried I uh, did a um, a, ripple, a, um, a, a what do they call it a wrinkle wrinkle finish on this thing. It takes it takes rimp, rick, I, I learned how to do it. It takes actually a heat gun. So I do a little bit at a time and use a heat gun. And you can you can actually develop you can start developing it rather than put it in an oven. I tried that once. It really it's, it's just it was too tricky. But using the ripple paint, doing a section at a time, using a heat gun, you can actually watch the ripple come up, and that that turns out to be actually quite controllable. So you can wind up with it with it not too bad. So anyway, you can see th this is a non-technical talk, obviously. So you can see how the thing actually uh, looks. Well, here it is. And uh, 
just a couple more pictures of uh, of, of, of uh, the, f the, the finish. Right? The finish on it. There it is. Were those the original tags that you put back on? Uh, oh yes, yes. They, 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 these are the originals. They the. Uh, and when you get a chance, just come on over and take a look at it. They were the that that cleaned up. Now this picture is kind of kind of nice because these first two cameras here, this one and this one, are the two cameras that originally came from Richard. Richard put them together. He Richard got the uh, iconoscope camera running, but you say it would run for a little bit and then it would start smoking. <laughs> the Orthicon camera, Richard. Uh, worked on that, it turned out that this long focus coil was open. This big, long focus coil, I think, for the orthogon. Richard unwound that whole coil and rewound it. Richard, I can't imagine somebody, you, you did it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and, and so, but I don't think you ever actually got the orthogon camera running. It turned out that there were a lot of, Do no harm. I don't put juice to it. That's right. That's a good, good, good thing too. So uh, it, it turned out that actually there were a lot of other problems with that camera, and uh, so <clears throat> I worked worked through it. Got got both of these, all these cameras working. Uh, two working iconoscope cameras, and in my house is a third iconoscope camera, which I'll tell you about this afternoon. So, uh, and I know of two other iconoscope cameras in the world, one in Japan and one in, one in uh, Australia. So here, right in this, right here, we have three working iconoscope cameras, which is, which is really kind of, I think, kind of uh, amazing. Anyway, the power, I built a power supply for the camera and uh, first um, uh, simulated it, put it together, works just fine, and uh, here is the um, the result, and I made a uh, I made a test pattern. It's actually over there in the by by that camera there, and so this is this is what it looks like. This is the, uh, it's running close to 525. The, uh, the, the these monitors here I have to use it with an analog monitor. A digitally based monitor like that Sony over there won't work. <coughs> These monitors are compliant enough. Uh, I actually had to modify one of the monitors to go down to about 50 hertz. So they're running uh, probably around 14, 15 kilohertz uh, horizontal, somewhere between, somewhere around 50 or so vertical on these on these guys, but not NTSC. They're a little bit slower than NTSC. Uh, it, 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 it does, actually, let's see, I think that's, uh, uh, I, can go, I can go back to that, that picture. I just want to wind up, this is, this is my last picture here, just showing you these cameras again. Let me, let me just, just go back to the um, circuit schematic and I'll show you where the high voltage is, uh, is derived. Uh, it uses actually uh, the um, power supply to actually also um, light up the, the filament or the heater of the iconoscope tube itself. Let me just run back, run back to the schematic and just point that out. There we are. Oop, went, went, went too far, okay. <clears throat> here, there is a master oscillator right here. This is, this is actually where the, where the tuned circuit is for the, for the horizontal. And it's running, it normally would run around 14 kilohertz. This supplies the heater current for the iconoscope because it's a kilovolt off ground, okay? That oscillator then powers this horizontal deflection circuit. Here's the deflection tube, it's a 6L6, and there's a damper right there. This is the, this is the horizontal output transformer, which drives the horizontal yoke and also drives these correction, these shading signals. There's a, there's a tilt and a, and a par par parabola shading signals that are derived for both the horizontal and the vertical. Because as uh, Richard was pointing out, these iconoscope tubes redistribute and you get shading, you know. So if you have enough, if you have more illumination on one side, it sort of tilts the whole, the whole pattern 
in that direction. So they re do require shading. Now then, on the horizontal output transformer, there's a, there's a tap on, on a little bit more of the winding. <coughs> this is the high voltage rectifier. It's a 6x5, an ordinary rectifier, that provides the negative kilovolt up to the iconoscope. You have the, the grid bias and the focus controls. So it's basically a flyback type of, uh, of uh, high voltage generation for the, uh, for the iconoscope tube. Not very far. Uh, the, uh, that, that's right. It's not very far. Uh, so I, I, as I say, I think I'm running it around. The, the, the monitors that I'm using are compliant, so I can run it around 14 or maybe maybe even a little higher than 14 kilohertz on the on the horizontal. Uh, the uh, video amp, several stages of video amp here. And the sink, it's the sink. The, the um, here's the here's the hor here's the actual. Uh, here's the horizontal oscillator, but it's not an oscillator because it's actually keyed to this tuned tune circuit uh, right here. This is, the, this is your master horizontal of frequency coming off. Here's the tuned circuit right here. It's called an oscillator, but it's really a bolt vibrator that's being triggered from the, uh, from the oscillator uh, and, gener and generates the, uh, the, the right waveform to, to, uh, into the, uh, the, the horizontal output tube. Vertical is very simple. The, um, the, by, the by the way, the um, Orthicon camera uses a, a, a phase shift oscillator running for the vertical, which is a very peculiar choice because it takes two, two tubes to do it. It takes these phase shift oscillators, you know, start up very slowly. You know, they just don't pop on, they start up very slowly. So it's a rather unusual circuit diagram on the Orthicon camera. Uh, the, the, several stages of video amp. Sync is generated in the sync gener in the sync shapers here, and gets put into the video right at the end. So that's actually how these cameras are put together. Four, seven, seven tubes, of the, so, four, rather seventeen tubes, takes about a hundred watts of power to power this uh, this, this camera. The uh, heaters. There's a 26 volt DC that powers these heaters in series parallel. Some of that 26 volt, volt DC goes over to uh, centering controls for the yoke. The rest of the rest of it is powered by about 400 volts at about a quarter of an amp that comes in probably from an external dynamotor that powers the rest of the camera. Okay, so when you get a chance, just come on over and take a look and. And you can see what's what's going on inside this thing. <clears throat> it's all been recapped. It works just fine. So, sorry, we got two questions. It's Jill? It's a shame to throw them away in one explosion. <laughs> Very. Uh, I had gotten that schematic years ago, and I don't remember where I got it. And uh, I had not located any other sources, so I have just that one schematic that looks like this. And I have not located any other sources. In a lot of magazines over the over the years, especially back in that time period, and also a fellow named Maurice Schechter in New York is a, the the leading expert in the world on the bomb cameras. He has entire systems with the dynamometers and, <coughs> yep. and the antennas mm -hmm. and the transmitters. He has the entire ensemble. Okay, uh, Denny, you had you had a question. For surplus equipment, we've got a <coughs> library about the lower. Wouldn't be surprised to find one version mm -hmm. of it there. Question on the use: um, Were these used in war-weary bombers at the end of the war? That was my understanding. Uh, not very, and in fact, the Orthicon cameras were not successful at all. That not not that many of these were actually put into service. Ah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. It, turn, it turns out <coughs> that uh, a, a, a number of a series of these were put together called the block series. And they, they all re rely upon a, a, a transmitter normally running in around the 200 and some megahertz range that would transmit the signal to a receiver. I don't have any of that in, that, those pictures with me. The receivers that, that uh, 
that the people who were piloting the drones would, uh, or, the, or the missile, would use. Uh, there was another aircraft, essentially, that was um, operating the drone? You could operate it, yes. You could either another aircraft fly, flying near it or from, from the ground. Uh, some of these transmitters actually had the capability of transmitting several different video channels all simultaneously. I don't know really how they were actually used in, 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 uh, in, in real life, but they had the capability of doing it. Every, every one of these block groups of blo what we call block. Richard, do you know? Do you, you, can you? Yeah, I wish I could uh, recall this a little bit better, but, but uh, they were they're incrementally approved, improved, never used very much. It was actually rather late in the war. <clears throat> that these were e even used, you know. So the I think these the earliest was about 1943, 44, and so by that time, you know, the uh, they didn't really see that much. They really didn't see that much service. They, they did like a few 27s or something. I, I don't know. They were full rearing planes. They would pack them full of bombs, left over bombs, mm -hmm. and you had to use a pilot to take off. And the pilot would bail out after takeoff and tra transfer control to the to the remote pilot in the chase plane. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Kennedy was one of those pilots. Yes. And he was killed during the testing of these systems. When he jumped out of, uh, he had taken off the plane. He jumped out and was struck by the tail. Whoop. Well, that was John F. Did they ever be used in combat? They, they did. They yes. did use a few of them. They the theater. Or? Well, they, it turned out that actually, when they tested them, they tested them down in the desert, in Southern California. And they worked beautifully, and then they took them to the Alps in Europe, and the multipath just ate them all. You could not receive a constant picture from them to save your life. And the the apocryphal story is that the um, that the. Uh, the remote control pilot would open his window and stick his head out the side of the plane and fly the bomb. <laughs> The uh, the, or the Orthicon camera was a failure. Uh, the Orthicons were, were easily blinded, you know, by by uh, sunlight or glints off something like that. They were too unstable. Yeah, there's no ATCs anywhere in these things. That's, that's right, and and so uh, the the Orthicons didn't work out at all. The bomber cameras, yes. Why did they change the horizontal and vertical frequency? They didn't change it. That's what they <laughs> they weren't trying to. They weren't trying to conform to any particular standard. Don't, don't, yeah, don't forget the standard, or the, the NTSC standard, uh, the NTSC committee, uh, the, the, by the last minute it was changed to 525, and that was, I think, was it around 1945, 46? During, I think, World War II. July 1st, 1941. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Before that, it was, you know, we had 441. And then, and then there was an NTSC meeting uh, with what Dr. Baker is the is the head of that committee. Don Fink. I wonder if it's any relation here. No. Don Fink, <laughs> a, a, a famed electrical engineer at the time, was on that committee, and he kind of dictated to the committee, 441 is not good enough. Let's do 525, and the committee agreed. And the FM sound. And the FM sound. Yeah, very good. <laughs> I'm speaking probably without, without not good memory here, but I have a copy, a real photo copy of the 1941 NTSC report. And I'm trying to remember whether AM was still in it in 41 and that it after. Can you find out for us? I will. That would be really that would be really interesting. I, I have the 1940. I have the uh, the the RCA color NTSC mm -hmm. proposal. It's a book about that thick. It's a red, red book about that thick. And in fact, my article that's in, that's in here was actually based upon that, uh, that proposal from RCA at, for the evolution of the, co of the NTSC color standard, which is a great story in itself. But the, uh, and, and I didn't talk about it during mine, but uh, <laughs> in, in July 1st, 1941, they went to the 525 standard, FM sound. Okay, FM sound and also authorized. They, author, they also authorized commercials. <laughs> commercials. Okay. No NBC. NBC was first. An hour later, WCBW, which was the CBS station in New York, ran some ads as well. Uh, 
they had a, uh, the first ad was the Boulevard clock, really boring, it was just a clock ticking and it said Boulevard time on it. And then they uh, ran, I, I saw a spreadsheet of some of the ads and one of them was Botany Mills, so it was a clothing company. <laughs> Great, any, any other? What, what, I can what else can people add to you? To those poor service guys servicing these sets, they had to go all around and, re and uh, recalibrate everything. Well, what do you mean by re They had to make them work. Make them, make them work. That's what I mean. Make it work. Yeah. They, they had to make them work. The, uh, the, um, the bomber cameras were actually pretty, pretty stable uh, if you compare it to a, an Orthicon camera. Uh, I can turn on the cam but my, you know, my three or uh, iconoscope cameras. And they'll come up immediately, and they don't require any any fiddling to make them work. They're just there, and that's again that's the reason that the Brits with their super emitrons, you know, iconoscope based, persisted till about the middle 60s in using them in their cameras, long before we went to Orthicons in this country, because they're 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 remarkably stable, come up quickly. They don't require a lot of fussing. And so I can understand why they stuck with the super emitrons in, 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 in the BBC when we were playing with the orthicons in this, in this country. I mean, uh, my, my experience with the orthicon cameras is limited to, to the one that I have that used to belong to Richard. And it takes a half an hour to get the camera wor really working at all. You have, to get the, you have to get it heated up inside the, uh, where, where, where did the, uh, in, 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 inside, where did all those, where did the, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, here it is. Inside the Orthicon, this is, the, this is that image multiplier section that I was, that I was talking about right here. In, back about here is where the target is that the, that the electrons from the image multiplier are focused on that target. This is magnetic focus here. That target has to be, uh, the temperature of that target has to be brought up to about 50 degrees centigrade. It's a, it's, a, it's a piece of glass that is so thin that they produce them by sort of making a bubble. And then cutting a little part of that bubble, incredibly thin piece of glass. They have to heat it so the glass is partially conductive. And then they, and then they put a, um, a, 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 um, a sensitive surface on it and then they put a, a mesh screen right in front of it to catch the photoelectrons that come off the front. And so that glass has to be heated to that temperature. It takes about a half an hour to get, get it up there before the tube really starts working at all correctly. So, so these, are, these are nasty, nasty things to get, get running. And I'm, I, I, you know, and then of course the RCA, I mean the, the RCA TK, TK10, TK30 were the first first studio cameras that used orthicons. And, uh, and then f f later on when, when color came out, the first color cameras, the TK40, used three of these guys. And getting three of these guys working together with the right shading, the right, you know, everything, I just have to take my hat off to those guys to get those first color cameras working at all. I mean, my god. Has anybody, has anybody here worked, done, done studio work in, with, with, uh, with, with, these, with these tubes? I actually tried to help get a TK41 working. Uh, can you, can, why don't you, got it do, we have a, do we have enough time, Tom, that? When, in, in, Sac, in Sacramento, Channel 3 came on the air as a, a color station in 1954, and they bought the whole catalog from RCA. I now have the 15-inch monitor in my collection, but they also had a TK-41, and I knew the engineers at the time, and I, I had been working, again, when I was in college, I, I did the transmitter for KVIE, and I knew a couple of the guys before that at channel, at channel 3. And so we actually did try to resurrect the TK-41 and got it mostly, they still had all the pieces, we got it mostly working, but at that point I learned about image orthocons and, and uh, again, getting three running at once. So you, you actually had the, the CCU, the camera control unit? Yeah, it was a rack of stuff. Oh, you had the whole thing? Yeah, we had the whole thing, the cables and everything. And 
They still have they still have at least the camera because they bring it out and put it on display every so once in a while. Bit about getting three all at the same time. Well, I <laughs> I mean it took I'm remembering it took the better part of an hour to warm up. And then there was another probably hour worth of setup on it before you could use it. They they used it from what I was told, they used it at first for the nightly news, and then they gave up and went back to broadcasting the nightly news in color, or in black and white. And there's, there's one other anecdote that I'll offer that they, they gave me, and that is the owners of Channel 3 was a, was a family, the, the, the Kelly family, and the Kellys in 1955 were hosting a party, and they, had their CT100 uh, at home, and they were adamant that they wanted to see some color television. So they they called up the they called up the operators and said, "Put on some color." Of course, they didn't have any color. They they couldn't bring the color camera up in less than a couple of hours, and so they were showing some old black and white movie. So in the middle of the movie, they just cut to color bars. <laughs> <laughs> transmitted color bars so the the guys at the party could uh, could could see color television so well I've, I've got one that has worked okay. it currently does not Tom's got one I've got one anybody else has a working CT 100 which is the which is the 1964 RCA 54 yeah that were all 5,000 were made they were all recalled except a few of us kept them. And then the RCA then offered 21 inch sets to those people. Why were they recalled? Huh? Why were they recalled? Because they just didn't work that well. Oh. And they were just finicky and the, the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the public was not satisfied. With I would say it worked real well, but the meantime between failure was only per the RCA service company. I think they had six service calls a year average on them. So they were... One of the external knobs on the side is the convergence, is one of the, is the DC convergence. You have DC convergence and focus, I think, are the two on the side. And the instability uh, of the focus and convergence is quite a drag. Well, I mean, it's electrostatic convergence, so it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the public was just not happy with their reliability. The 15-inch the monitor is much more complicated than the CT100, and it's and it's and the the chroma demod. There's tweaks. There's those little patter caps all through the chroma demod circuit in it, which aren't in a CT100. I was also told by someone who was supposed to know that the tubes that went in the monitors were hand selected from production, and the, the two good tubes, the two really good tubes that I have remaining were from the 15-inch the monitor that I have and the other 15-inch monitor that they tore up for parts in the 60s to keep the first one running. And those tubes do converge fabulously. So there may be some truth to that. If any of you CT100 owners are tired or unhappy with it, Gladly accept one for the museum here. We'll make space for it. Look at our display downstairs. We'll make space. Uh huh. Just a hint. Oh, really? Tom, how are we doing? Like a CT100, get something uncommon. You know. It's the first one. So. Well, no, there were other. Westinghouse was the first one. Oh, first RCA. Yeah. It was the first RCA. Yeah. yeah. We'll take home. <laughs> So let's get well, John, I just have one comment. Yeah, for him. Goes uh, we contact the Early Television Foundation in Ohio. Oh, yeah. They just had a, a raffle for one of those CT100s. It was an extra. Yes. Did they? They may be happy to donate. One. I thought they were doing a TRK12 this year. They did. Last year they did the CT100. Last year, last year they did the CT100, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit more about your collection. Okay, Mike, you, uh, do you want to...
Okay, let me let me just just, just say you know, we do have a, we do have a um, display downstairs. If you haven't been downstairs yet, we have a display uh, television just almost directly below us. A, 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 uh, a television display with, with Gilles' head end, which is providing signals on many, many channels, including channel one, by the way. Um, <laughs> channel one. And we have a working mechanical set. It's a 1929 uh, uh, Western, Western Digital Visionette. It's a 48 line triple interla interface using the other Hawk converter that Richard was telling us about. It, it cost a fortune back then. And it's generating a, a, a 48-line triple interlaced. And so we'll be happy to turn the set on. And you can see a 48-line 48, 48 triple interlaced um, uh, uh, mechanical uh, si uh, signal. So during lunch or when you're wor working around, uh, come on downstairs and take a look at our, at our display.